Thank you for tuning in. My name is Chris. Let's do some science. So the first paper I wanted to bring up is, well, there's two papers, the Owen paper in 1963, as well as this J.N. Swallow paper in 1967. And this is going to be the backdrop for this whole video. It's the reason why we don't give tetracyclines during pregnancy, as well as don't give them to pediatric populations. So as you know from the sketchy, which I'll show right here, this little image kind of exemplifies the fact that we don't give tetracyclines to these patient populations. This was first documented by Owen in 1963, showing that giving greyhound female dogs tetracyclines resulted in tooth discoloration in their pups, like in their litter. That was then expanded on a bunch of other research, but particularly by J.N. Swallow in 67, looking at tetracycline usage in CF patients. So in these patients with cystic fibrosis, they looked at these tooth discolorations. They had three groups pretty much, and they were able to dot, they looked at the teeth and they looked at under regular light and under fluorescent light, and they assessed tooth discoloration, and they were able to assess and show that tetracyclines were associated with this more. This has been further expanded on and it kind of comes down to these to this um, process where the tetracyclines they bind to uh, divalent metal cations such as calcium but including um, aluminum and iron and in the teeth it actually can bind to certain compounds there specifically this uh, calcium orthophosphate. It binds to that, sticks to the teeth, then that tooth, when it becomes um, exposed to light, then it goes through this like oxidation process and turns from yellow to brown. And this is also seen in bone and cartilage, and that's kind of one of the reasons why we don't get tetracyclines. In first trimester, we're not going to give it as well because there's a neural tube defects. And so in general, like there's hepatotoxicity with tetracyclines as well. So we're not giving them. These is well documented and that's super great. But the point of this topic is I'm talking about doxycycline, which is something that you wouldn't want to give to someone as well. Like you get your world step one question and they're saying kid coming in with presentation for a Lyme and like nice targetoid rash, he's six years old, and the option is gonna be like doxycycline, and the other one's gonna be amoxicillin. And then you're gonna be like, oh no, I'm not gonna give doxy because it causes tooth staining, and you check amoxicillin and you'll get it correct. But I want to go and kind of focus on just a little bit more of this research and what actually has been coming out in regards to doxy. So, this paper talking about CF and tetracyclines came out in 67, which was the same year that Doxy came out. And Doxy is also called Vibramycin, and this was made by Pfizer. And because these findings in tetracyclines came out, they actually put a class, like, they kind of lumped all the cyclines together and said, hey, you can't give any of these, including doxycycline, even though it's been shown that doxycycline has a two to three fold decrease chelation effect in regards to its ability with calcium. So we're kind of moving forward here with this new question and this review article is kind of something that I wanted to go across and this is out of um, the UK as well and this is Cross et al. And what this paper goes and talks about is the importance of doxycycline um, and kind of pulls in all of this research. Um, in regards to pregnancy and pediatric populations with the use of doxycycline. And they were able to pull down 140 different review articles, 140 different articles, and they just assessed and saw, is there really a prevalence here? Like, should we not be using doxy? Or is doxy a good alternative for patients that have a lot of these rickettsial illnesses or malaria in different parts of the world so that they're able to treat it? And that's where we're going to get into kind of this exciting stuff. So some brief information about these tetracyclines. These are the structures that it looks like. It looks like this. So they look pretty similar. They're all both four ring structures. And you can kind of see these different changes and, you know, the uh, 
methyl groups um, kind of on the upper two rings. But moving forward, I mean, these are bacteriostatic. These hit the 30S ribosomal subunit, and they are usually absorbed in the gut. Uh, they have decreased absorption if you're taking it with milk, and that's why the indication is that you should be drinking milk two or three hours prior to ingesting your doxycycline. And these doxycyclines differ from tetracyclines furthermore, as well as on how they're given. So tetracycline uh, was given as a four time a day dose. So you have to take it four times a day. Doxy is a one time a day dose. So there's a little bit difference in, in how you're administering this as well. And so what this paper was looking at was the review articles, right? So there's two specific ones that I want to bring up in regarding, in regarding randomized control trials. And there are two kind of uh, pooled retrospective studies that came through as well. So these uh, retrospective studies were looking at potential teratogenic effects of doxy. And they looked at like 60,000 kids in like this Hungarian pool. And they looked at 30,000 kids that were born in Tennessee. And they were not able to find really any effects of teratogenicity in doxycycline compared to like normal controlled infants. So that leads us to think, okay, well maybe this doxy kind of kind of thing is a little bit blown out of proportion, which is what I'm trying to present to you as well. Um, the other thing that I do want to talk about are two specific studies as well. And the first one is this American Indian Reservation study where uh, children under the age of eight were treated for Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever, and we know that this is a rickettsia illness that you can use doxycycline for. And when they looked at their controls, so they had 53 patients that they gave doxy, and they had 213 patients that they didn't give doxy. And when they analyzed this data, they were not able to see that there was this tetracycline-associated tooth discoloration in the patients that were given doxy. And this was analyzed through pediatric dentists who analyzed the tooth at that time for any tooth discoloration, uh, incisors and molars as well, which is something that I guess other papers wanted to look at as well. The second paper was looking at a liquid dose of doxycycline for severe asthmatics. And in this, um, they were looking at a uh, experimental group of 31 and a control group of 30. And in this one, they were not able to find any tooth staining or tooth discoloration in any of the groups. So there was two specific studies, and these are the largest randomized control tiles, RCTs, that we have to date that are looking at the effects of doxycycline in pediatric populations under the age of eight. Which brings me to my last point. So <clears throat> doxycycline and tetracycline's in the, in the whole lot before 2015 were all FDA category D for pregnancy, which means you pretty much shouldn't be using them. They're, they are contraindicated from research. But in 2015, of course, the FDA had moved away from this alphabetical category, and now there's an opportunity to use doxycycline. And, but there needs to be more information done because right now there's not a whole lot of randomized control tiles, not a whole lot of perspective, not a whole lot of longitudinal studies. And we need all of these in order to have a better assessment about the possibilities of the teratogenic effects of doxycycline. Now, why would we want to go into all that work when we have like other alternatives? So I said moxicillin you can already use for this Lyme disease, but so for doxycycline, it is a pretty effective medication. It has very good CNS penetration which helps out with a lot of these CNS issues for like Lyme and such, which I guess you would still use that triaxone. But the cost effectiveness, so in populations in Bangladesh, India, Thailand, where we do have high prevalence of like Babesiosa or Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever, doxycycline is a good drug to use in these populations. And furthermore, the competitors, which would be either like a clindamycin or azithromycin, don't fall necessarily in the same cost bracket. So compared to doxycycline, we have azithra, which is like five times more expensive, and clinda, which is 20 times more expensive um, in these really poor third world populations. So the opportunity to kind of look at doxycycline as a potential alternative, cost effective, and highly therapeutic could be a good avenue for future research and future global health uh, initiatives. So I hope this 
video and this look at a systematic review was helpful. I hope maybe that I've uh, inspired some of you to be more critical about what we kind of have been fed in general. Um, I'm going to link all the papers that I used um, in the description below. Um, any questions or comments also leave them in the comment section below and I would love to hear if you guys ever have any inputs about your uh, impressions or your experiences with either receiving or using, do using doxycycline um, either during pregnancy or in pediatric populations under the age of eight. Thank you for tuning in and until next time.